All right, guys, on today's episode of Globe Trotting with Trey, I have a very special guest. Today is November 28th. This new book, Elvis and the Colonel, is now out and available. I have already read this book. And guys, I highly recommend any fan that enjoys my shows on Elvis to pick up a copy of this because you're going to learn about Elvis and Colonel Parker, the real stories. That's what my show's about. I want you to know about the real Elvis Presley. I want you to know about the real Colonel. And I think that if you go into this book with an open mind, you're going to look at Colonel Parker a lot differently. So I want to introduce the co-author, right, Marshall? Co-author of Elvis and the Colonel, Marshall Terrell. Thank you, you for that doing? wonderful introduction. How you doing, Marshall? I'm doing great. Thank you for the kind introduction. Well, Marshall, man, as you already know, guys, and I'll go ahead and mention it. Y'all know I love Pistol Pete Maravich. Here is my book here. Marshall actually is the author of the Maravich book. I realized that a few days ago when I, uh, uh, Marshall and I uh, connected about Elvis and the Colonel. So Marshall also has written, or he's the author of Elvis still taking care of business with Sonny West. And I'm sure most of you fans have read the Sonny West book. Marshall, how in the world did you start doing all these books on Elvis Presley? Well, actually the first one started with, um, well, let me go back. When I was in high school, I read Elvis, What Happened? And I thought, wow, this is, I didn't take it like other people took it. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, I graduated in 82, so it was five years after Elvis had passed. So I read that book, and I was just, like, fascinated, you know, like, wow, he did some really interesting stuff. I didn't I didn't see it as a negative book. I just saw it as three guys telling their story and this tragedy that happened. Um, so that, that kind of stuck in my mind. And then later that decade, in 89, I started writing about Steve McQueen. And then when that, that book got published in 93, um, then I, you know, was looking to do my second and third and fourth and just make it a career. Well, one of those books that I did was with a lady named Barbara Lee, who uh, had a two-year relationship with Elvis. So I thought at the time, I was like, this is great because she had a relationship with Elvis Presley, Steve McQueen, and then Jim Aubrey, who was the head of MGM all at the same time. We called it the King, the Queen, and the Love Machine. And yes. and what was what was good about that was um, that I did not have to write about Elvis's entire history. I only had to write about two years because, as you know, he had an epic life, and um, it's overwhelming for anybody to try and tackle that. And um, so I was introduced to Elvis that way, and then. Barbara was still friendly with um, Sonny West because she said, hey, Sonny's looking to do a second book. He wants to make amends for that first book that he did. So I said, OK, I'll talk to him. And then right away, I talked to him and went, wow, this guy's got a great story to tell. And, and the idea that, you know, that he wants to he, he the fact that the first book kind of went awry and the way that it was released, it was released two weeks before his death. And then Elvis died, and then everybody came toward the three bodyguards like they were the villains. Yeah. And uh, so I thought, well, this is kind of a redemption story. He wants to redeem himself for for what he did. Yeah. And so we told his story, and that book took four years to write. So when I when I said in the beginning that I didn't want to like write Elvis's story, well, I've now written it, you know, several different times. And then I did a book with Rex. Rex and Elizabeth Mansfield. And again, that was back to only two years of Elvis's life. So I didn't have to do the whole story. And then, of course, and after that, I thought, well, that's going to be the last Elvis book that I do. And then um, I was introduced to Greg McDonald through uh, a friend. And I said, OK, I'll, I'll hear what he has to say. And then sure enough, you know, great storyteller. And yeah, I love the idea that it was an untold story about Elvis and Colonel and that he had actual facts that nobody's ever had before to tell and documentation to prove it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of this new book. I think 
like you said in your intro, if people have an open mind and they're open to reading about Colonel Parker, they might just see him in a different light than they have in the past. Well, I see the Colonel in a different light. I've always, I've always had respect for the Colonel, Marshall. But in the 80s, in the early 80s, which you guys will learn about when you get this copy. That's why you've got to get this copy. Marshall just mentioned about that they have documents to prove things. You're going to see you're going to see payouts of Colonel Parker and Elvis during the concerts in the 70s, which is going to show you guys about that 50-50 nonsense. And I say nonsense because it is Marshall nonsense. And you will learn a little bit about how much Colonel took, how much Elvis took, and how much expenses were involved in these shows for you fans to, to enjoy and get your scars back in the 70s. But uh, Marshall, you talked about Greg. Okay, so fans, who is, Marshall, who is Greg uh, McDonald? Well, Greg McDonald um, was a teenage boy when he, actually younger than teen, when he met Elvis and Colonel Parker. You know, he um, he lost his mother at an early age. He and his, his father was um, doing air conditioning and they were kind of floating around California and Palm Springs and, and, and Palm Springs and, and uh, you know, changing people's air conditioning. And his father worked for a company that changed the air conditioning for all these very famous stars. Um, and so, it's just, so it just so happened in the early 60s, I want to probably say around 61, 62, Elvis just happened to be in Palm Springs in the summer. And he, and Greg, according to Greg, he, uh, Elvis wasn't, but there was a beautiful blonde woman out on the deck. It was buck naked, sun tanning. And uh, the kid just, he has the keys to all these famous houses. So Elvis was, was in Jack Warner's house, the, the very famous studio uh, mogul, Jack Warner of Warner Brothers, and uh, loaning his house out to Elvis Presley while he and this young girl were out on the deck sun tanning. Greg didn't see these two. He lets himself into the house. He's changing out the air conditioning. And then there's a little dog that w runs in and starts barking and starts uh, biting at his pant leg. And then he hears this voice, hey, son, come out of there. So he comes up and he looks up and it's Elvis. And um, and so he's like, what are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm, I'm just changing out the air conditioning. And so he said, Elvis, uh, and then the kid was like, well, what are you doing here? He goes, well, me and my girlfriend, and he points to the girlfriend who was out, you know, on the deck who's nude, and then he shuts the uh, curtains. <laughs> and then he sits down, and he has this incredible uh, conversation with this 11-year-old boy. Uh, they discover that um, that they have this mutual uh, uh, relationship in the church and the people that they know. And, uh, you know, Greg... Greg had to uh, grow up really fast. So I imagine when he was 11 years old, you know, he talked like a little, he probably reminded Elvis of a, of a small man, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so Colonel Parker calls over at the house and says, Elvis, what are you doing? He goes, you're not going to believe it, Colonel. I got, I got this young kid over here who's really funny and he's changed my air conditioning. And Colonel Parker goes, well, I need my air conditioner changed, my filter changed. Send that kid over here. So, he has this little wagon. He pulls his air, air conditioning filters over to Colonel Parker's house. And then uh, and then Colonel Parker strikes up a conversation with him. In the process, he learns that Greg um, isn't going to school. And uh, that really bothers him and his wife, Marie. Um, but he, you know, after this conversation, he peels off a $50 bill, which, you know, is a good amount of money to change somebody's air filter. And he gives it, gives it to Greg. And um, then this relationship starts between Colonel Parker and Greg McDonald. And nobody knows mm -hmm. for years, they've been wondering what this relationship was about. So um, after a few years, uh, Colonel Parker sits Greg down. He says, you know, Marie and I have talked about this and we, we don't think it's good for you to be working with your dad all the time and not going to school. If we could make arrangements, would you come and live with us? And so, um, you know, Greg's dad, uh, you know, it, it took some time, but he understood. So basically, Colonel Parker and Marie raised Greg 
uh, from the time he was 15 to the time that he graduated. And then Greg, um, he, he showed him the ropes. He showed him the concert ropes. And in the early, late, uh, yeah, in the late 60s, and the, as you know, Coachella now is like the hot place, right? Yes, it is. Yeah. I mean, nobody even wants to go to LA anymore. They want to go to Coachella. Yeah, and, and, and I can tell you right now, Palm Springs could be the hottest uh, real estate that's going on right now. I mean, wow. uh, I visit there every year and every year the hotel prices go up. Everything goes up. Home prices are just through the roof. Yeah. Uh, 70s and 80s, you couldn't give property away in Palm Springs. But That's incredible. I didn't know that, Marcia. Yeah. So um, so then he teaches Greg the ropes on, uh, on, on how to become a concert promoter. And his first act is uh, Sonny and Cher, which you read about in the book. The great, great, funny anecdote about that. But then Greg becomes the man in, in Palm Springs and Coachella Valley, yeah. booking all sorts of acts. And Colonel, you know, Colonel Parker did ask him to uh, work for him. But Greg always said, I was making more money as a concert promoter on my own than I would have if I worked for him and Elvis. And the Colonel, I think, really respected that. But with that said, he did a lot of favors for, for Colonel Parker and Elvis. And he did... He did become an employee of Boxcar uh, Entertainment um, sometime in the mid seventies. Okay. So anyway, there's this incredible relationship with with that El that he has with Elvis, but it's mostly when Elvis comes to Palm Springs. Yeah, but it, during the six Greg guys, Greg in the sixties was driving Colonel Parker during the Elvis mo uh, movie years. He was driving in here there in California back to Palm Springs. Greg's living with Colonel and his wife. I mean, the 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 stories that are that's in this uh, point, right? <laughs> that right there, that book right there are stories you've never heard before because I've never heard them before. And you know me, I know this Elvis story. Uh, so I've learned a lot of new locations, uh, Marshall. The Jack Warner, that was incredible. I, ha I had no idea about the Jack Warner uh, house in Palm Springs. And I've got to ask Greg, who in the world was that blunt? I want to know who that blonde was. You know, she was topless, guys, out there at the pool with Elvis. Who is this blonde we don't know about, right? And uh, 11 years old. So he was 11 because I, I know in the book, and it's really funny, you know, he he knew he was in the room talking with Elvis Presley, and his mama loved Elvis, and he was a fan of Elvis. But he said, I couldn't take my eyes off that girl out at the swimming pool. <laughs> you know, so I'm gonna ask, I have to ask Greg, who is that blonde, Greg? Who do you think it was, you know? But, uh, but man, yeah, the incredible story with Greg, just being around um, and knowing that Colonel was, had influenced Greg and Greg became like, successful uh, booking these acts around Palm Springs. And Colonel is coming to these acts when he's in town and giving his advice to Greg, right? That's right. Yeah, he would, he would do a count in the room and he would give like a very accurate count of how many tickets he sold. Yeah. And they say, now, Greg, I love this part, because because at that time, Greg was advertising to a lot of oldies acts. He's like, now, Greg, did you did you put a, a classified ad out in the uh, obituary section? You, you know, that's where that's where all the oldies acts go. You know, they, they look at that section. So, you know, advice there. And what Greg said was whenever the colonel saw an empty room, he envisioned a place where something could happen. And, you know, he'd always be on Greg. What's happening? What are you doing this month? Who do you got going? What are you booking? And he, he said it was like, it was like not a drill sergeant, but just a fatherly figure saying, hey, you know, you, you know, are you, do you have anything going on? And it was kind of Colonel's way of encouraging Greg. Yeah. Um, and so I think with this book, you see the Colonel in a more human light. Father um, figure. He's a father figure. Father figure, you, which is strange because you, you don't see him that way. Now, in in the preface of the book, we state that the Colonel Parker, Colonel Parker's very famous saying to Greg was, the artist always wears the white hat. And what he meant by that was, I can be the bad guy. Even in the newsroom, your editor always says, hey, if, um, if, if somebody has a problem with you, tell them that your editor is asking. Let your editor be the bad guy. Well, that was the same situation here. And that was, you know, if, if, if the pu the public has to see Elvis in the certain light, and Colonel Parker was willing to take those hits, mm -hmm. and did, and didn't really care what people thought of him. 
So I, you know, I think that contributed a lot to Colonel Parker's public image and that he really didn't care what people thought. Um, but, you know, had he not been good at his job, I don't think Elvis Presley would have kept him around for 22 years. 100%, I agree with you. Marshall, man, look, the Colonel was brilliant. The Colonel was the man. Look, you have to have talent to do what Colonel Parker did with Elvis. He took Elvis from Memphis, Tennessee as a Southern guy. And Elvis took over, not the United States, he took over this entire world because of Colonel Parker's willing and dealing. And what I mean by that, my favorite story I think in the book is when they go and make the movie deal in Hollywood, the first time Colonel is in the room with three executives, the Colonel goes up into that room, guys, and he demands a certain pay for Elvis. And they didn't want to give it to him. So the Colonel, the guy that I guess was with the Colonel, now is the name escaping you. Read Last Fogel. Then he's the guy that ran um, William Morris Agency. So he makes a he makes a remark to Colonel in the meeting of something to the effect of, you know, Colonel, man, what are you doing? You know, you're going to blow this deal. And Colonel looked at the guy. He looked at the guy, Marshall. What he say? He said, he said, how can you lose something that you don't even have? And gets up and leaves the meeting. Goes to the oh. hotel there in Beverly Hills. And that afternoon gets a phone call. He got the deal for Elvis that he wanted. It took Colonel telling these guys, look, I'm going to get what I want. I don't have anything yet. And getting up and leaving the meeting for them to respect what Colonel wanted. That is a guy that I want as my manager. I can tell you that, Marshall. Absolutely. All for and Elvis. And he loved Elvis. And you'll understand in these stories, Colonel Parker loved Elvis Presley and Elvis loved Colonel Parker. So Marshall, before we were cut off, we were talking about how Colonel loved Elvis and Elvis Presley loved Colonel because Elvis kept Colonel until the end of his life. And uh, doing your research, Marshall, uh, talking with Greg and, and researching Colonel's story out, do you believe for real that Elvis and Colonel loved each other? I mean, yeah, was that absolutely. Pain? I saw a letter and we did, I couldn't put it in the book because it was owned by the Presley estate. But um, when they first signed the deal, uh, Elvis wrote, he ended the letter with, and I love you like a father. Mm. Yeah. So um, that was the beginning of the relationship. Of course, when everything was rosy, I, I think, but I mean, yes, of course. You, one thing you have to understand, and that is it's historical context. And that is, the men of that era didn't hug each other. They didn't tell each other that they loved each other. Um, I've met several men of that era. My, you know, um, you know, it, it's a it's a different era than today's bro hug era, where you give everybody a hug. It wasn't like that back then. These guys, you know, Colonel was a came up through the depression. Yeah. Um, Elvis was a child of the depression. And men were just harder, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you probably have a grandfather that probably served. Well, you told me a little bit about uh, your your past. Your grandfather was a basketball coach. Yeah. I'm sure he was not a touchy feely guy, right? My granddad, I, I can sum it up. Y'all see how Clint Eastwood is? You see how James Garner is? That was my granddad's era. That was the era of Colonel Parker and and Elvis. Right. Men like that. Now, I know Colonel was a little older, but that's how men were. And uh, they just, you know, they had a, like a, yeah, like a, a, a certain toughness about it. My granddad was a tough man. He got on the referees all the time. But my granddad also was a friendly fella and, uh, uh, you know, would help you and uh, fought for right and wrong uh, during the um, 60s when black and white, you know, because had, he had black uh, players and he he fought for their rights. You know, that's how my granddad was. But man, yeah, he was a tough guy. He was a he was a tough man. I see what you're saying there. And yeah. and and I want people when they read this book, I'm not going to tell them this story because it's also one of my favorite things to learn about. When Colonel had Elvis for the first time over at his house on Madison in Tennessee, the house unfortunately marshaled these dummies decided that it was smart to knock down to, to build a car wash now on the location this house guys where colonel lived was elvis presley enterprises 
Colonel made some of the biggest deals of Elvis's life there in that home. Uh, Spa Guy has fil luckily filmed inside of it, so Billy was able to capture this home before it was knocked down. But man, uh, you talk about a story, Greg shares a story in your book, where Colonel left something under Elvis's plate that first dinner after they signed, after Colonel uh, Elvis signed with Colonel, and Elvis never forgot that. Now, I'm, don't tell them what it is, Marshall, because they need to go buy this book to, to find out. I thought that was fascinating, what Colonel left up under that plate for Elvis. And it was the first time that he probably had ever seen, <laughs> seen that, you know. Uh, but back to Elvis, uh, Colonel being a fa father figure uh, based off your stories. Let's go all the way back, though, to the Colonel his early years, man, because y'all really did explore that and you shared a lot of interesting things. And then when he got into the uh, to the circus, to the carnival, that's where Colonel Parker really started building that persona of who he would later become. And then also talk about in Hawaii, the first person that Colonel Parker ever managed was a daughter of a preacher that he <laughs> thought was pretty. So he had built up the courage to go and talk to this girl. As she, she sung in a sermon that the colonel was at in Hawaii when he was stationed in her Hawaii. And the colonel thought she was pretty, as I said, walked up to her and said, hey, uh, do you happen to have a manager? And she said, no. And colonel became this girl's manager and booked her around Hawaii. And it was something, Marshall, I think y'all mentioned in it, that it was kind of like a job where colonel was able to get out of his army, his base duties because he managed this girl. So he was able to use her as an excuse to get off base when he was having to probably clean, clean the like, latrain, la, train, whatever it is, the bathrooms, you know? Yep. So talk a little bit well, about- let, I don't want to correct you, but let's, let, let's set the record straight. I don't believe this was a very pretty girl, um, oh. but this was the general's daughter on base, okay? So he decides that he's going to become her manager and it, it gets him out a lot of, um, a lot of heavy duty, like peeling potatoes and cleaning the latrines. And, you know, um, he, that's what I loved about Colonel Parker was like, not only did he think different, but he was clever. I mean, I would never, ever want to be on the other side of the business table because this guy had a dangerous mind and um, he could screw you 10 ways to Sunday. But I mean, in the sense of not screw you over, but he would walk all over you mentally. And it's it it's street. And what I love about it is it's street smarts. It's it's not book knowledge. It's it's knowing who you are uh, sitting across from the table and not having just one plan B. You've got 10 different plans that you can go through. You know, and, I, and when I wrote about Steve McQueen, the actor, he was street smart too. And these movie executives with all their PhDs and uh uh, lawyers' degrees, and they, they, they didn't know how to handle them. It was yeah. the same thing with Colonel Parker, because Colonel Parker, uh, you know, everybody, everybody puts him down for coming coming from the from the circus, and um, but man, that uh, I could see where he would use how he set up uh, a show the same way he set up a rock and roll show. He, I mean, you can book. see you can see how it transferred to rock and roll. Marshall, your your book painted that picture for me. What you're just saying. Uh, uh, because you see some of the stuff that you guys have talked about that he did during his circus years, that was stuff he used in the 70s with Elvis. That is the stuff he used in 56 to put, get Elvis on national television. The uh, uh, Y'all explore his carnival years, and the carnival people saw that Colonel started making them more money than they had ever made by just doing things like my favorite one that y'all, and I laughed when I read it, so they had some kind of exhibit there in the carnival and the colonel got a bright idea to put a sign inside of it that said exit, but nobody knew that it said exit. It was like in a foreign it was language. It said e egress. Egress. That's it. Colonel yeah. put this on the uh, inside the little tent. So fans would pay their nickel or their dime to get inside this thing. Then they would think that they were going into another room. Really, they exited out of the tent, so they had to come back around and pay another dime to get into the colonel's tent. That is how brilliant Colonel Parker was 
uh, in the, in his carnival days, I thought that I was like, wow, okay, I see, I see why Colonel was who he was. Yeah. He was doing this from day one, man. He just, he just, it just grew into something bigger like Elvis. Can I tell my favorite, my favorite circus story? Yeah, tell me that. I, I want to remember. You. So, you know, he was he was putting all sorts of different types of jobs at the circus. It's yeah. kind of what the military does. You know, my dad was in the Air Force, and um, you know, they 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 make you do a series of different jobs in order to build you up to become an officer. And that's what they were probably doing with Colonel Parker. But so he was in charge of concessions at, at one point, and um, and so he uh, they had. And, and they loaded everything on trains, but in this, in the, one day, they loaded the this these bar this barrel of lemonade underneath the uh, underneath the, the lions and the and the big cats. Yes, I remember and that. I think they they probably took a nice big healthy piss from one destination to another, and so uh, he was serving this lemonade um, to uh, to his carnival folk, and they were tasting it, and they were like. You know, this just doesn't taste too good. And, and you know, these were rough customers. And the colonel said, you know, we're trying out a new recipe. Doesn't seem like you like it. Okay, we won't use this anymore. <laughs> you did talk about that one. I remember, yeah. <laughs> hey, there was also another one that I really enjoyed, and it just put you in the mind of Colonel. So he's the, going around in these carnival towns, and they're staying at these flea bag hotels. And he talks about this to Greg. And he, he shared a story with Greg that he stayed in a room one time and he didn't have towels. Then the bed sucked, I guess, Marshall. And so anyway, uh, uh, he goes to uh, the office and this is how the Colonel thought. And this is why Colonel became Colonel Parker and why he made the deals for Elvis that he made. So listen to this story, guys. The colonel, instead of going into that office like you and I, Marshall, and probably 99% watching would do, being kind of upset because, hey, you know, I've paid y'all money and this room, the bed is not comfortable and I don't have towels to take a shower. The colonel went to the office and he learned early on in his life that it's better to be nice to people and they'll work for you until be, in, instead of being mean to people. So the colonel came in there and just told the guy that he just wanted to come in here and tell him that I travel all over this country doing this carnival stuff. And I just want to say that this is one of the best hotels and rooms that I've ever stayed in. And I just wanted you to, to, to know how, how I love your hotel and your rooms. And this guy started asking Colonel, you know, what can I do? Is there anything else I can get you? And the colonel was like, you know what? Could I have some extra towels? Hey, and also, is there any way that you could turn off that no vacancy sign, you know, it's shining into my, my room and I'm going to try to go to sleep here in a little bit. Yes, sir. That guy turned the sign off. He gave Colonel the towels and the Colonel learned very early from some stuff like that, how to do people. And when he's trying to get something out of somebody, he came at them and asked them, you know, Hey man, you know, how can I help you? Uh, you know, I, I really enjoy what you've done for me. Just, you know, being nice to people. I thought that was a fascinating uh, a, a story that Colonel shared with Greg. Yeah, he, he really knew psychology and he didn't use it. He didn't employ it in a dangerous way. He, he did it in a way that uh, would be helpful to him, but also be encouraging to the other person and lift that other person up. Now, if you interview any other people, like if you ever get a chance to interview Charlie Stone, um, some other people that it's Sam Thompson, other people that work for the Colonel, they'll give you, they'll give you the same stories that I'm giving you that he was, you know, good guy to work for very fair. Uh, he would blow up every now and then he, he would call that his volcano when his volcano would erupt, but you know, he, he was in a very, um, pressure filled situation, you know, and, uh, you know, geniuses are allowed, I think, uh, to have those moments. Yeah. You have your good and your bad. Unfortunate for the Colonel is the early eighties, a lawyer, uh, a judge in, in Tennessee, in Memphis, um, pretty much painted Colonel into this villain character that we now all know today and, and how fans now talk of the Colonel. 
And that's why I said at the start of this video, I want all my fans to just have some respect for me on this episode to have this story with an open mind for Colonel Parker because he, Colonel was a human being. And because of that nonsense fairy tale Elvis movie that I, I can't stand, uh, Marshall. Here, here. Not, it's not fair to Colonel Parker. And it's not fair to Elvis Presley. If we're here trying to, to, to put real things out there on these guys using, as you mentioned for your book, actual documentations that prove stories and stuff that Colonel shared with Greg while they're riding from Palm Springs to California. I mean, Greg is getting firsthand tell uh, stories from the man himself uh, riding in a car with him. So Colonel is telling Greg his life stories that he's probably never shared with anybody else before in his life, man. So this is why your book is so valuable. And uh, Colonel Parker deserves it. He, de he deserves us to go in with an open mind and, and, and kind of understand why he did things the way he did it. I believe that's important, Marshall. What do you think, man? Oh, absolutely. Um, in, in order, I think, for people to really understand uh, Colonel Parker is, you know, his mindset. Um, the reason why he moved from the Netherlands was because he said, as a young man, I thought like an adult and the people there did not understand me. So I had to move away. So it, it wasn't, you know, this, 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 this nonsense about him killing somebody and jumping a ship and going to America and starting all over again. Um, that started uh, and that started in a book, Marshall. Yeah, I think that started with Lamar Fike, if I'm not mistaken, with, with the, the Albert Goldman book. I believe I believe that, or it's either that it will, or uh, Lena Nash. Um, that 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 started with Lamar, and 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 um, um, and I know Elena, and Elena is a good lady, and I like her a lot. And you know, she she did. Uh, I thought she did a great job with her book. Uh, ours is just a different take on Colonel. Um, and uh, you know, she was she did a lot of diligent uh, work on it. Um, but uh, uh, what I was getting to though was. Um, that he left there because you know I, I know and I know a lot of people I I, I know a young German lady uh, that I've worked with over the years she said the same thing like the people in Germany didn't get me I always felt like I was an American and that's why I came to America and that's what he so but I'm sure he he had no clue probably what he was going to be or end up becoming but it was kind of cool to see like this guy who came from nothing evolved into something. Yeah. And, you know, the other, the other thing too, is uh, you'll get to learn in the book is that what an animal lover Colonel Parker was. Mm -hmm. and I think, I think if anybody's an animal lover, uh, they'll see, they'll recognize that in someone else. And, um, um, you know, he, he, he ran the uh, Tampa humane, uh, this, the humane society, which actually, put on uh, extravaganzas and, and shows. And that's how he first started getting into the promotion business. So well, I, he was smart enough to evolve and, and have the courage to follow his dreams. And talking about the Tampa, I was going to ask you this. Explain to me, because y'all talked about how Colonel said one time he, would, he set up like these barrels. And some guy came up in there, and I guess people could put money in the barrels, and Colonel yeah. lifts it up. So explain that one to me, because I felt, I felt that was fascinating. Well, again, it just shows you, Colonel Parker, uh, how his mind worked and how he had a plan A, a plan B, a plan C, a plan D for everything. So somebody would come come to the Humane Society and say, oh, I want to make a donation, but I've I've only got a $20 bill on me. And, he, and Colonel would say, well, how much were you prepared to, to give? Oh, I wanted to give $10. So he'd say, okay, give me the 20. Give me the 20, uh, uh, push, over, push over the barrel. There's money on the bottom of the ground. Grab a 10, give it back to him. <laughs> so he I'll never let anybody out the door without making some sort of donation. Well, it was for a good cause, and and he was willing. You know, that's the other cool thing about the colonels that uh, a lot of the charitable aspects that are attributed to Elvis actually started with Colonel Parker, and uh, you know they they had a lot of 
charity events, you know, uh, for the USS Arizona, uh, for the uh, cancer thing for, for, for Hawaii. Um, and the Colonel was not going to allow, or, you know, and they, they never, in any, any tickets that they had, they had to buy. They never, there was never giveaways. Yeah. 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 So, and that was, and that was also to help improve Elvis's brand. There were just, Colonel Parker was not going to give away anything and wow. everything went into Elvis's pocket. Well, you know, the Colonel <laughs> talking about the, the animal stuff, you know, there's that legend out there that the Colonel had some kind of uh, act in a carnival where, uh, we, was it uh, chickens? chickens? Yeah. But the, the Colonel told, but... the Colonel told Greg that, you know, I wouldn't have done that to, uh, to an animal. No, that was to test somebody's gullibility. So, um, you know, the colonel was was a cynical guy, and he would test people's gullibility, see how far, you know, see if they were, uh, see if they were a hayseed or not, basically. Um, and uh, so, and he was also having fun with people. So, uh, again, just, uh, you know, he he came from that carny background, and that, you know, that that's the other, that's the other thing you have to understand with context. And um, the older generation, I, I, there was a great scene in the movie Gran Torino with Clint Eastwood. Remember when he goes in and he's uh, going to get a haircut? Yeah. Guy, and they're just busting each other's chops. And the young man is like, got his mouth open and they're busting. They're just, they're just putting each other down. Um, but that's how people, you know, dealt with each other back then. They, they gave each other a hard time. That was, that was a sign that you like somebody. Yeah. And it's the same thing with Colonel Parker when he so today everybody's so sensitive. But uh, back then, it, that you know, the, the whole plate thing was just another way of putting somebody on. Well, you know, I just after I finished your book, you know, I, I thought about one thing. Um, I, I thought about how I learned about why Elvis did the Aloha from Hawaii show. And it was a, it, you know, the colonel and Greg were riding in a car, if, if I'm correct, and mm -hmm. there was a over the radio. There was going to be some kind of satellite broadcast. Yeah. Right, Marshall? remember. Well, I don't know how old you are, but I remember this as a child. Uh, well, I wasn't a child even then. I was nine years old. Um, it was it was a historic event where Richard Nixon went to China. Uh, to open up relations, uh, uh, and it was broadcast via satellite, and so there was a big deal made of that. So they were driving in the car, and they're listening to this broadcast from China uh, via satellite. And, and again, this is how the colonel's mind thought: "How I wonder how I can use that for Elvis." <laughs> sure right. enough, concert became. And, that, and what I was getting to is that that becomes the Aloha from Hawaii. Never been done before. Elvis is everywhere like he should have been because he was the man. But the Colonel, what you're going to learn when you read that book right there, buy it. I'm going to have the, the, the description, uh, the link in my uh, description of this video. What you're going to learn is Colonel used that Aho Aloha from Hawaii events and others in the 70s to motivate Elvis. He found out if he could get Elvis motivated and excited about something, he could get Elvis to, to straighten up and he could get Elvis to be Elvis Presley that he knew. And Elvis would 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 make sure that he was in good shape. Elvis was wasn't going to get himself into situations that he would get himself into in the 70s. Let's just say that. Colonel used this stuff to help Elvis because he wanted Elvis. He he didn't want he didn't want to see Elvis like he was seeing Elvis, and the Colonel was not. Or see what people's got to understand. Doctor Nick was not around Elvis twenty four seven. Uh, I was friends with Doctor Nick. Colonel was not around Elvis twenty four seven. Unfortunately, I think Doctor Nick and Elvis should uh, Colonel should have been around uh, uh, Elvis twenty four seven at a certain point because Elvis kind of to me just lost control of himself and it's so sad after reading your book realizing that the colonel was trying to figure out ways to motivate elvis to get elvis off this crap 
And your book clearly says things like that, man. Uh, and Aloha from Hawaii was one of the big things. Elvis got motivated. Elvis started working on his tan. He started watching what he was eating. He, he didn't take stuff. He, he got himself. And then he does the Aloha from Hawaii concert. And the very next day, he's on a couch. Marshall, and that was the saddest thing I think I, I read read of the book. You know, he's, yeah. he's on the couch out of it because he took some. Right. And that's sad, and, man, you know? Yeah, and Sonny West had confirmed that story with me when we did that book. Uh, but yes, that 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 was the that, yeah that was the the beginning of the end. But if you if you look at it this way, Marshall, go and watch the '68 comeback special, and then put the Aloha from Hawaii up next to each other. Elvis is an entirely different man. He he doesn't move in a Aloha. Aloha, his his face has changed. You could tell already by that point, Elvis was going through serious problems in his life. And like I said, it, it just made me respect Colonel Moore when Colonel found out the only way that he could help his friend is to try his best to get Elvis playing these concert shows and give Elvis something to make Elvis be a normal human being and not seclude himself and take whatever he was taking, you know, man, that, that really was something that stood out to me reading the book. Well, and the biggest, the biggest revelation of the book, as you know, is um, the idea that Colonel Parker came up with when he went backstage at a Billy Graham show. And, you know, so I want to hear your thoughts on that because that, that is definitely the big bombshell of the book. And, I th that, that was, yeah, I'm glad you just brought that up because that was something I wanted to ask you about. What would it have been like for the gospel show? <laughs> so what, what we're talking about, guys, is, and, you know, I don't want to give everything away because I want them to read this, man. I, I, I love this story. But Colonel goes to a Billy Graham crusade with Greg. So Greg is with Colonel. And, and the Colonel is just fascinated how they run this Billy Graham crusade, right? And he's fascinated by the, the crowd at the stadium. And he's fascinated by how the uh, people were given the money, just everything. So the colonel's like taking notes in his mind. So he tells Greg that he has this idea to do an, pretty much an Elvis Billy Graham type show. And Elvis is going to travel around the country just doing gospel in stadiums, right, uh, Marshall? Right. And each... The cool part was in each stadium, the city would provide a a, a, a backing gospel choir of right. 100 people. Guys, have you ever heard that before? And this was late, I believe, seven, this was 76. 76-ish, yeah. This was, and, and that's why it never happened. This is something the colonel was building for Elvis. It was going to be his next thing if, if, uh, if Elvis could have uh, stayed with us here. Elvis well, that, that's also tied to a new ownership that Colonel Parker would have uh, allowed to happen, uh, but that didn't happen as well. So, um, but the gospel thing, here's what happened. He and Colonel loved show business, as you know, and he wanted to go check out a new stadium. He would, he wanted to go see Billy Graham, but he knew, he knew every uh, stadium and uh, arena owner in the country, he, you know, and so he had heard about this new San Diego stadium and he wanted to go and he knew his, his, the friend that ran at the general manager, he wanted to go visit him. So he said, Hey, Greg, let's go see him. And so they go and they see, they, they check out the Billy Graham show. And um, now keep in mind that with, with the, there's, there's no donations given at a Billy Graham show, but they were behind the concessionaire stand and they were in this back office and and Colonel Parker was seeing all this money that was flowing through with the concessions. And, you know, he's so on the drive back, he's like, you know, Elvis is always playing these gospel songs. What? If, and he saw the size of the, you know, the crowds, you know, Elvis was playing uh, arenas yeah. and he didn't like playing stadiums because of the sound. And so, but he, he saw where, um, you know, he just saw the whole spectacle of this whole thing. And he was moved by it. And he said, you know, 
this is another thing like, you know, the 73 show that could motivate him. And so Greg said that he got on the phone with Elvis. And at that point, they weren't talking for months. There would be months that went by because um, the drug issue, um, it caused a lot of, it caused a lot of problems between uh, Colonel Parker and, uh, and Elvis. And Colonel so, didn't like that. Colonel did not like how Elvis was doing. And Colonel wanted uh, him to change. And unfortunately, the only person, guys, and hold your thought, Marshall, is the only person that can help himself is Elvis at this point. You know, I mean, Red, Sonny, and Dave tried, and they got fired. And, you know, most of you fans hate them because of the book that they were trying to make Elvis realize to, to get himself off of his drugs, you know? But go back to the, go back to this back to the Billy Graham crusade though. I don't want to um, get all that. Anyway, he, he, you know he's he, he he's talking to Elvis and Greg's in the other room and he's sort of listening in and you know uh, he got off the phone and he went, man, that re went really well. Elvis was really open to the idea, and so Greg said, but if I'm to pull this off, I've got to get Elvis off the road for a few months and retool. And that would require new ownership, new, new, sorry, new management. So, um, so, and it would require a certain amount of money because as you know, Elvis was going through money pretty fast. Part of the reason people don't like hearing this, but part of the reason that they, they like to blame Colonel is that, uh, you know, Elvis got you to stay in the movies. He did this, you know, the Colonel didn't update him at all. The part of what drove Elvis's artistry was the money. Elvis had a lifestyle. He had Graceland. He had people on a payroll. When he went on tour, he had 112 people that he had to, to, to support. And, and, you know, I asked Greg, is that, is that normal? He's like, that's crazy. That's because especially back then, you know. But anyway, money was really dictating Elvis's artistic choices. So, um, Anyway, back to the to the under new management. So, Colonel had to devise a way to get Elvis off the road and pay them a certain amount of money so that he could retool this gospel show. So, Greg Greg's accountant comes up with this couple. We'll we'll leave them nameless until they read the book, but they're they're philanthropists out of San Francisco and they want to get into the entertainment business. So they do cut Colonel Parker a check for $10 million. And the way that this management situation would work is this guy would now become, he would, he would, Elvis would earn his same percentage that he did with Colonel Parker. Colonel Parker would, would stay on as the manager, but get a 25% fee. Mm -hmm. And then this guy would collect the rest. And that was going to happen. And um, I won't tell you the reasons why it didn't happen. Got to read the book. But you know, these are some of the new revelations that are coming out through Greg. Man, and like I said, when I read that story, I, I had never heard that before. Never heard that before, Marshall. So thank you for- No one has. No one has. And thank you, Greg, the, for you know, that sharing was, that story. But you, 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 you talked about the money. You talked about the money. In your book, y'all mentioned uh, what, when uh, Elvis and Colonel joined together, do you remember what Elvis told Colonel, Colonel about money? Yes. Can yeah. you tell the fans? Well, and he, he told them, he said, you worry about the money coming in and I'll worry about the money going out, which basically meant, Colonel Parker, you're not going to touch my money. Um, you you bring it in and me and my daddy, Vernon, who had what, an eighth grade education, yes. are going to watch over it. And, and you'll read throughout the book that Vernon hits up Colonel Parker for loans consistently. Um, Guys, you're going to learn. You're going to learn. I told this to somebody the other day. You're going to learn that in 1978, Vernon contacted Colonel and asked Colonel to take over the um, uh, the estate, right, Marshall? Correct. Colonel saved Graceland. And what I mean by that is Colonel made a deal for uh, merchandise or something like that, I believe, Marshall, and if, correct me if I'm wrong. He made a make five million dollar deal that saved Elvis's estate after his death. So you guys, you got to respect Colonel, man, because if it's not for Colonel, we don't have Graceland today. I'm just saying. 
could, perhaps. Well, and one other thing that I, I want to mention, and that is um, the Colonel gets the blame for this. Uh, he got the blame because in 19, in the early 1980s, when, when, this, when this judge looked at the estate, he blamed Colonel Parker for Elvis taking the RCA deal that he that bought him out for $5.4 million so that he could use that money to pay up Priscilla in the divorce. Colonel always gets blamed for that. He tried to talk Elvis out of that. He said, Elvis, that's your annuity. And he was right. I mean, you know, there's there's all sorts of royalties. There's there's the, the royalty from radio play. There's royalty from, uh, you know, television. There's royalty from record sales. And so the, those, those royalties, I believe those RCA royalties were bringing him in like a million dollars a year. Yeah. You know, and that, and that would have continued on. Um, but he wanted to pay off Priscilla in that divorce and get it done with. And so not only was um, Colonel Parker, uh, he didn't want to do it. And what Colonel told, or sorry, what Elvis told him was, you know, I'll get Ed Hookstratton, the other attorney. If you don't want to do it, I'll get Ed Hookstratton or yeah. someone else to do it. So then Colonel Parker said, well, then I might as well overlook it and oversee it. And in this book, guys, you're going to see how Colonel was trying to talk sense into Elvis about that. And as Greg just mentioned, it, it goes and bites Colonel in the butts at the end. And that's why that's they use that to kind of make it look like the Colonel, you know, was had taken all this money from 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 Elvis, which that is not a accurate, you know, reality of the story. Uh, but, you know, but, and let me interrupt you here. Let me just explain to the audience. There were basically four or five different pots of money so okay. that they understand what kind of percentage the colonel took. So there was movie money, which he took 25 percent of okay. record record money, yeah. um, merchandising money. And um, anything that so th those are all 25 percent. Anything that Elvis didn't have to wake up and perform, Colonel got 50% of, okay? The other 50% came from the touring, but the Colonel had to employ a team of people to do the tours because the tours were heavy. And Elvis, before they even split the 50%, all the expenses that Elvis had incurred were written off. So that came right off the top. So after Colonel got his quote unquote 50%, um, you know, there wasn't much left. And so it was I'm, Elvis's favor. That's what I'm saying, Marshall. Elvis got his money. Elvis Presley got his 50%. Colonel had to pay for all the expenses to produce the concerts. Correct? Right. Is that correct, Marshall? That's correct. Now, RCA that's what, would also and I tell everyone. Yeah. And, and RCA would pay, I think, $50,000 a show and advertising uh, cost, but yeah, that, and, and Greg says, and Greg's, by the way, has worked with some of the biggest concert promoters, Irving Azoff, um, uh, a lot of big guys, and they've all said, I would not take that deal. Not only would they not take that deal, but they wouldn't take the um, option of exclusivity. So when he did get his 25%, most managers get 15%, but you have to remember Colonel was, uh, not only his manager, he was his promoter. Um, he was his lawyer because he did all the contracts. Um, he was his uh, he was his PR person. Yeah. You know, so he had like four or five different uh, jobs that he did. And Colonel's only working for Elvis. You know, Elvis was trying to get him to sign um, uh, Elvis's girlfriend. Uh, what's his name? Uh, the actress and Margaret. And Margaret. Yeah. Colonel, you know, he wanted. I guess Ann Margaret has had talked to Elvis into talking to the colonel and the colonel was like all right my boy i'll, I'll do that but you just got to know one thing if i do this i'm gonna have to give her the same amount of time that i give you so you just let me know if that's going to be all right with you elvis and i'll give Ann margaret you know 50 percent of my time and i'll give you the other 50 percent elvis thought about it pretty quickly and said nah nah yeah you're right about that colonel you know i mean i love that I love, I love that, friend. Marshall. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, and you got to go find somebody else. But uh, so what I'm getting to is Colonel only worked for Elvis. 
Elvis had Colonel all by himself. I mean, so 100% of Colonel's time, as Greg explains how his work schedule was, was pretty much all day and night was for Elvis Presley. Right. And never, and never took a vacation because he, he, he explained to Greg, why would I have to go? Why would I want to go on vacation? This is what I love doing. I yeah. mean, he lived for promoting Elvis Presley. Yeah. And you I want to be like that in your corner. Presley. I don't want to, I don't want to give this part away because I, they have to go read this book for this story. But there is a story where Elvis, uh, not Elvis, but Colonel and Greg are out in the Colonel back, backyard and Greg and Colonel, Greg witnesses Colonel cry. No one has ever heard Colonel and crying probably ever in the same <laughs> sentence. Uh, I'm not going to tell anything more about that because I just, it's a really, um, it was, it's a really sad and really important part of, of this Elvis and Colonel story that I think every Elvis fan needs to know about it. And that it just comes from Greg. It was only Greg there with Colonel when this story happened. And I believe when you read and learn what I'm talking about, you're gonna, you're gonna question everything you've thought about with Colonel Parker um, there at the end of Elvis's life. Well, and one other thing, while all this was going on, I think the last decade of his first wife's life Marie, yeah, he was bedridden. He was, he in addition to, to promoting and taking care of Elvis, you know, he was taking care of her. Can you imagine the the, the heartbreak, watching the love of your life just kind of dissolve in front and of your eyes? And it seems it seems like Colonel was faithful to her even during these absolutely. times. Absolutely, absolutely. He was all by himself. Uh, it looks like he was by himself in uh, California and Vegas a lot of these times and then coming back as much as he co could. Uh, and I think, uh, I think y'all talked about that, you know, he had like, I guess, 24 hour service. Yeah. She, 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 she had the best available uh, 24 uh, uh, seven um, service in, in terms of caretakers. What, what um, was wrong with her? Yeah, I think she had a brain tumor. I'm, 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 I think that's what it was, but, but um uh, I have, I have to go back and refer to the book, but I think I think it all had to do with that. And just you know, for the last ten years of her life, she just spiraled, and uh, it was not a slow death. And um, so, can you imagine like the the heartbreak that it, he must have been going through, but never showed it to anybody and made sure that she was taken care of. Yeah. Wow. And you know, Greg talks about he would be over. Uh, Colonel liked to cook. And uh, have barbecues, right? He At his house there in Boston. Boston. I and never he, asked Greg this. But he, he cooked this thing called the hobo stew. And uh, it sounded so gross, I didn't even want to ask what it was. But, you know, those old carnival days still stuck with him. Hobo stew. Okay. Maybe we can get Greg to cook that for us. Does he know that? Yeah, that, that would be fun. I think you guys should do an episode with Greg out in Palm Springs. Hey, and if he you could set it up. Sites. Tell me, tell me this. Uh, what? Did you, after doing this, I assume, do you spend, when you do your books, I guess, do you go and, and visit like Greg at his house and you just spend days doing this recording and just talking, going over and, and, and coming up with your. Yes. And it, what, what had happened was is I, met, I met with Greg and, and, you know, we recorded, but, you know, I also have the, the, the background. Um, and then when I, um, and then when I write the book, I send it to Greg. When he approves, um, then I send it. I, I have a couple of Elvis experts myself, and I run it past them. I want to make sure all the facts are correct. Um, and so they, what they liked about it was like, okay, this is a story that we haven't been told yet. This is a story from a real insider that was there. Um, if you would allow me to read the introduction of the book. Let's do it. I, I think, in, by the way, you're the only one I've done this for. Um, It'll give you an idea what the book is about, but it also shed some light on, um, on some things uh, about the Beatles, for example. But give me five, seven minutes to read this to you, and okay. uh, I, I think this 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 really gives people an idea of what this book is about. So, All right, Elvis and the Colonel. Here we go. 
Colonel, Colonel Tom Parker has gone down in history as a malevolent leech, the Svengali-like, cigar-chomping, iron-fisted manager of the king of rock and roll. That's the myth. The man he, in fact, wanted the world to see. He chose to play the heavy when the situation called for that. Quote, the artist always wears the white hat, Parker said more times than I can care to remember. The artist, of course, was Elvis Aaron Presley. The mantle Colonel Parker wore, rightly or wrongly, for decades was easy for the press and public to digest, offering a clean and palatable story with no shades of gray. Elvis could remain a saintly figure if Colonel Parker remained the heavy, despite his Carnival Barker demeanor and P.T. Barnum-like facade, the real Tom Parker was nowhere near his public persona. He conveyed that image because he constantly had to do battle with businessmen, bean counters, and lawyers who had Ivy League backgrounds and lots of credentials hanging on their walls. The Colonel only had his street smarts and his reputation to fend off the wolves, and he used both to his advantage. His negotiations were great theater because he elevated it to an art form. I've always contended that the Colonel was a much better actor than Elvis Presley ever was. He created a persona to instill fear in his opponents across the table so he could get the best deal possible for his client. So what is truth? What is legend? What is misunderstood or misjudged? And what is false? What history and countless other books on Elvis Presley don't tell you is that Colonel Parker was the first mega manager who made forays into today's multimedia world of music, film, television, publishing, and Las Vegas style entertainment. Parker, along with his once in millennia star, Elvis Presley, blazed many paths in the span of two decades. Elvis, the artist, and Parker, the enigmatic manager who made it happen behind the scenes, were the greatest pairing in entertainment history. Though the Colonel may have actually appeared to many to be shrewd, flamboyant, crass, and brash, in actuality, he was fair-minded, loyal, funny, a 27-4, workhorse, a man whose word was his bond, and even philanthropic and private. Many of Elvis Presley's artistic endeavors had a charitable aspect to them thanks to Colonel Parker's prompting. The two men provided major support through financial contributions and raising awareness for several charities throughout their decade, two decades of success, including the USSA Memorial in Hawaii, March of Dimes, the Salvation Army, St. Jude's Hospital, and the Kylie Cancer Fund. Colonel Parker was also an, a lifelong animal lover and even worked, once worked for the Humane Society in Tampa. Colonel Parker made sure to give fans, concert promoters, and business clients their full value while at the same time leaving them wanting more. Conversely, he got his client the best deals possible for the maximum amount of money. He was getting Elvis nearly a million dollars a movie and 50% of the box office net when the biggest stars in Hollywood might have gotten 10% at most. Colonel Parker got those extraordinary deals because of his savvy and smarts. He was also strategic and zen-like in his feats. Get his client the maximum deal while saving enough gravy for those who sat across the bargaining table from him. Others wanted his services too. The Beatles, Frank Sinatra, George Hamilton, Anne Margaret, Tony Orlando, Tanya Tucker, they all wanted Colonel Parker to manage them. To manage them. I remember when one of the Beatles, I believe it was Paul McCartney, called Colonel Parker at his Palm Springs house shortly after the death of Brian, after the death of Beatles manager Brian Epstein in late August 67. He took the call, excusing himself to another room. After he got on the phone, he, he said he couldn't take them on because of his loyalty to Elvis. It was a testament to his greatness as a manager that the Beatles wanted him. The fact that he turned them down was a testament to his belief in his client. All business dealings were done in military-like precision and secrecy. Parker kept his mouth shut for several reasons. What he was concealing was far more astounding and complex than has ever been revealed. While an uneducated far Dutch farm boy who grew up in a modest apartment above horse stables, he also had an innate knack for creating a spectacle and weaving the public heart and soul into it. The Nashville scene, Hollywood, and Las Vegas were not going to be a match for him. Before he got to the top, Colonel Parker rode the rails as a hobo, 
sail around the world in the merchant marines, served four years in the U.S. Army, spent a decade as a traveling carny perfecting his act. He understood human behavior and learned how to squeeze a nickel out of it all, making him the perfect power behind the entertainment throng. Colonel Parker arrived in this country, a penniless immigrant who had to overcome a language barrier and to scrap, battle discrimination and bias. Yet he, became, he came to befriend US presidents and CEOs, and he created a cultural icon for the decades who generated four billion in his lifetime, all while managing to keep a low profile. There have literally been hundreds of books written about Elvis and a few about Colonel Parker. However, none of those writers and biographers were ever in the room when the, wheel, when the deals went down, but I was. I knew Colonel Parker for almost four decades from the time I was a kid. I drove him around Los Angeles when Elvis was making movies in Hollywood, hung out with him when Elvis started his Las Vegas residency, traveled with him when Elvis started touring again and spent countless hours with him in his office in Palm Springs, California. I saw firsthand how Colonel Parker worked, how he played, which was not very often since he was a workaholic, how he negotiated contracts, and how he made, made sure there was enough honey to go around. And I know how the deals were made. I can tell you this, nothing went down without Elvis's knowledge and consent. And Colonel Parker earned every penny of whatever went into his pocket. Rest assured, way more money went into his client's pocket. Many biographers and people in Elvis's inner circle have inaccurately portrayed their business and personal relationship because of their lack of knowledge. They only knew a fraction of the story. They did their best to, to investigate or find out. However, they couldn't peer into the character of Tom Parker, which is essential to the story. First and foremost, Colonel Parker never talked business to outsiders. While he might have hyped his client to the press, he never spoke of the details of the business. The same went for Elvis. Their business dealings were strictly private and between them. These two men will forever be entwined in history like other famous business partnerships. Henry Wells and William H. William G. Fargo, William Proctor and James Gamble, Bill Hewlett and Dave Packard. They made beautiful music together, metaphorically speaking. But Elvis has gone down as the bright half of the pairing, whereas Parker has always been chased by a reputation as the dark half. My hope with this book is to dispel that myth and all the negative feelings associated with a man who has nothing, who has been nothing but kind to me and my family. This is a story who could give P.T. Barnum a run for his money, the grand advisor of aggrandizement, the, the Pisha of Bazaz, the Baron of Ballyhoo. Ever wonder where rain checks, concert t-shirts, tour books, and mass merchandise came from? The answer is Colonel Parker. He could sell tickets to two flies wrestling on a window plane, and the line would go around the block. He is the all-American immigrant's tale, a poor Dutch farm boy who came to the United States seeking and achieving the American dream and introducing the world's greatest entertainer to the world in the process. And it's better than any movie you could imagine. Man, Greg. So that is Elvis and the Colonel, an insider's look at the most legendary partnership in show business. Greg McDonald, and Marshall Terrell. And Marshall, the, the book's out today, November 28th. How, where's it going to be at? How can we get a copy? I'm going to put the links in the, the description here so fans can easily click and order. Amazon, uh, Books a Million, where, where would it go be at? Everywhere, Amazon. Um, go to the St. Martin's book, uh, book link there. Um, any place that sells books, bookstores, uh, it, it'll be widely available. Uh, St. Martin's, who is promoting this book, has done a fantastic job. I mean, they've they've gotten it out everywhere. They they really believed in this book, and uh, we we hope it'll have a pretty big impact. Oh, it is. I I, I read this book, guys, in three days. It's three hundred and fifty pages, and uh, I was just man, page after page, I was learning stuff that I didn't know, and it stuff was uh, making more sense to me now. Like I said, I went into it respecting Colonel already. I mean, I give Colonel his props, as y'all know, on this episode. Um, and so that's why I want y'all to go in with an open mind. If, if you hate Colonel, please read this book. If you love Colonel, please read this book. Uh, I think uh, it'll be beneficial to everyone. And, and uh, the thing is, man, like the uh, we, we talked about the, the, uh, the sign in the tent. 
the exit sign. I, I loved it. I mean, that, and then Gene Austin, we haven't mentioned him today, and I'm not going to say anything else, but that's the first guy that, uh, the first real singer that uh, uh, Colonel managed, I believe was Gene Austin. Was that his name? That's right. Yeah. Led to, led to Hank, led to Hank. I'm friends with Hank's son, uh, Jimmy Rogers. So yeah, Jimmy, me too. And yeah, Jimmy, with Jimmy's Jimmy's good friend. He's a great yeah. guy. Tell, tell him that you uh, talk to Trey and, uh, next time. Uh, Jimmy, uh, Jimmy and uh, actually is going to be an, at an event with Spa Guy and I. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, Jimmy's told us some stuff. And Colonel used Hank to get Elvis because yeah. Gladys was a Hank Snow fan. So more, you'll understand that even more in this book. And just the, uh, the, the pay skills and everything, man, y'all did a really great job to making me understand what I knew uh, just because of my research, but you made me understand it by seeing how much Colonel, because y'all put actual numbers. Uh, they'll put actual pay number, numbers that uh, Colonel got on certain um, 15 uh, city engagements uh, during 75 or 76 or 74. So uh, all of that will... Um, you know, you, you guys are going to learn about things that you just don't know about, man. And, and Marshall, I appreciate all your research. And before we go today, I want to ask you two things. And you, you can say whatever I want to ask you is what is a what is something that Greg shared with you that you could tell us that maybe is not in the book about Colonel Parker? You know, he. um I, you know, I think we let it all out there, yeah. you know, I really do. I don't, I can't think of one thing that he told me in confidence. Like, and, and there, there are, there are always those types of stories. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's stuff about Steve McQueen that I know that I'll never let out. Yeah. Um, you know, with this one, he, he, he just let it ride. I, I, that's that's great, mm -hmm. man. Cause there's a lot of stories in there, but you got to call Greg for me after we do this and ask who is the blunt. Who in the world was that one? Trey wants you know, to know. I, I'll be honest with you. I just, I, it, it, it might have been just a, a starlet in Hollywood. Oh, man, you know, I know, uh, but it's going to be somebody we know, man. It's I, don't, be I don't know if it's somebody famous. I just think of, you know, probably just, you know, just a beautiful uh, <laughs> woman that he, he probably picked up in Hollywood. Another girlfriend we don't know about. Yeah. Okay. The next thing I was going to ask is tell us, tell us your favorite Sonny West story from doing the Elvis still taking care of business book for Sonny? Oh, uh, let's see. Um, you know, he tells a funny story. <laughs> he told a funny story about uh, Elvis and Palm Springs. And and this, this story sort of illustrates a uh, how Elvis lived and what it's like to be a major star. But he talked this, he told a funny story about how um, <laughs> it was like when he first got the Chino Canyon house that Elvis called Sonny to come get him and he didn't know how to get out of the house he didn't know how to unlock the gate um, and there was a cab waiting for the guy and they let the cab driver go but Elvis gave the cab driver a hundred dollar tip and cab driver says something to the effect of hey Elvis if you never you, you never you never need to ride again you know let me know but it was it was a funny story but it also just went to, it kind of illustrated how um how when you're a star everybody does stuff for you and you can't even like unlock a gate i mean it's i guess it's humorous and it's sad in a way yeah but it, it it's truthful in that it shows you um you know uh, um i mean John Lennon didn't know how to really drive a car that well. I mean, once people, once you become a star and people do stuff for you, um, I remember uh, I just did a book called Fame, and there was a funny story about a, a, a famous basketball player who um, was suffering through a really bad toothache and a uh, and a cold at the same time. And somebody asked him how long is, he goes, "It's lasted for like two weeks." Well, why haven't you done anything? He goes, "Oh, I don't know how to call a dentist." Wow. So he just suffered. You just suffered because yeah, after a while, everybody does stuff for you and you, uh, so, so I can, you can see where somebody come, kind of becomes uh, detached from reality. 
So there was probably, you know, a lot, a lot of that with Elvis. Although Elvis, I, I always thought Elvis uh, retained a great sense of humor about everything. You know, he, he, I think he had a very wicked and funny, dark sense of humor. And Elvis was a lot smarter than I, people gave him credit for. There's always a, a tendency in this country to put the Southerner down. But, oh, yeah. um, you know, some of the smartest people I know are Southerners. Hey, I'm a Southern guy, so don't be putting me down, you know. <laughs> but yeah, no, uh, uh, Elvis was a very smart person. I mean, you had to be smart to get to where you were with Elvis. Absolutely. Uh, but, you know, and and Colonel uh, Colonel had a problem with all the guys that were hanging around with Elvis. And uh, uh, how I look at that is, is Elvis wanted all those men around him. He did. That's, you know, these people want to blame, you know, they want to blame Red and they want to blame Sonny and they want to blame Charlie Hodge and Joe Esposito. They want to blame all these guys. But at the end, like these guys gave their whole life for Elvis Presley. They sure did. That was their job, guys. And like, I can tell you, they, they, they suffered afterwards. They, they, Sonny, they suffered Sonny, Sonny, I can tell you now, I think Sonny now, but Marty doesn't have Marty Lacker doesn't have a um a grave marker. That's Sonny sad. didn't have one. Sonny West, one of the guys, the Memphis Mafia guys. So there was two guys that when they died didn't even have grave markers on their grave because they gave their lives to Elvis. Now Red Red West was able to have a career. Uh um uh, uh, and um, a few of the other guys were able to, you know, GK had his own thing going for, for him. Um, Sam Thompson had stuff, you know. So it, the thing about it is you don't need to be blaming these men, man. They Elvis had them around for a reason. Yeah, they were his lifeline. They were his lifeline to sanity, absolutely. And I, I believe that when, when Sonny West told that to me. Um, we should start a GoFundMe page. Uh, if those guys still have markers, we should start a GoFundMe page for them. Well, Sonny, I believe, now has one. I believe in the last two months, uh, Sonny, Sonny has a marker on his grave. Well, I visited his grave last year, and he didn't have one. Spa guys had pointed it out to me. And, um, and you know, because you know, you, know, you know Sonny went through hard times. You know, and you know, I'm telling you, all the guys did. Because, like I just said, they gave their life to Elvis. That was their life. That's why when Red, Sonny, and Dave got fired, they're upset because uh, I found an interview from '97 where some some fan uh, some fan overseas criticized Red during an event and like got on the microphone and kind of just said, you know, how dare you write in that book? And, and and Red said, well, you want me to tell you the truth? Why I wrote that book? He said because I wanted my family to eat. There you have it. That's the truth. And that's, I mean, that's the sad part is, you know, people make these guys villains, but they were there for Elvis. And like I said, Elvis wanted these men around. That's why they were around him. Yeah, And they would have literally taken a bullet for him. They would. You no, know, there were very, very, some, some, some uh, death threats and yeah. they were ready to step in line and take that bullet for him. Yeah. But to get back to your one question, here, here's what Greg told me. Now I'm not going to name names, but he basically said, uh, when these guys were going through some very hard times, um, Colonel, after Elvis's death, and they needed money or they needed a job, Colonel Parker stepped up to the plate and cut him a big check or cut him. And and I won't tell you the guys, but some of the guys even badmouthed them after that. I hope you enjoyed this incredible interview with author Marshall Terrell, Elvis, and the Colonel, a new book that I highly recommend all fans to pick up a copy. All the links are in the description of this video. I have an Amazon link. I have a link to the uh, publishing company for you to click and purchase your copy today. You will learn stories about Colonel Parker that you've never heard of before because they're from a friend of Colonel's, Greg McDonald, who lived with the Colonel and his wife for a few years and stayed family friends his entire life. Guys, pick up your copy. Don't miss this book. Get it. Get it today. And thank you so much for watching Glow Trotting with Trey. Please like this video if you did enjoy it. If you stuck all the way to the end, 
You are my true fans, and I appreciate you guys. I truly appreciate you. And share this video with other Elvis fans that you think might be curious of, of learning more about Colonel Tom Parker and Elvis Presley. I'm telling you guys, read this with an open heart and open mind, and I believe you're going to going to have a better understanding of the colonel. Thanks for watching this episode. Until next time, I'll see you down the road. Mm -hmm.